Welcome to A Window to Bourne. I'm here today with Skip Barlow. Skip is a lifetime Bourne resident. And uh, Skip, thanks for joining me today. Thanks for having me. It, it's, it's interesting to end up here being interviewed as opposed to being the interviewer. So uh, this is going to be cool. I know. We've seen you on, uh, on Bourne TV in, uh, in, in a different capacity. You're sort of yeah. a, a local star around here. I don't know if I'm a star, but I'm from around here. Well, <laughs> let, let's, start at, let's start at the beginning. Yeah. So, uh, so I, I said you're a lifetime Bourne resident. Is yeah. that true? Yeah. I, I grew up in Buzzards Bay, like, like a lot of people at that time. Yeah. It was a lot different then. You know, it really was. I, I, first day of school, I went to a one-room schoolhouse for a few days, and then they sent me to Sagamore. And, you know, it was, I was all over the place. What it year was, were you born? 1948. Okay. So I'm kind of a baby boomer. Yep, right? yep, yep. Yeah, so... It was pretty cool, and we lived kind of on a hill about about a half a mile from the bay. From Buttermilk Bay. From Buttermilk yeah. Bay, but between the house where I lived and grew up, in the bay there was a cranberry bog, mm -hmm. you know, and there was there was a hermit that lived out in the woods there, like in a, top, in a real top paper shack. Really? Lot, yeah, really. Yeah. Lived there for years. Wow. You know, he was a squatter who lived out there. Yeah. And uh, <clears throat> got to know him when I was a kid. He was a good guy. You know, but he, had, he lived the real life. He had an outhouse and top, an actual wow. top paper shack, and he lived there. Wow, wow. It was pretty cool. It's hard to imagine that happening these days. I mean, Yeah, now people use plastic. <laughs> you know? right. It is, but the, people still do that. Yeah, you don't yeah. realize it anymore. It's kind of unseen now. Right, or like, like the idea of a, of a kid hanging out in the woods with a, a grown man in a tar paper shack. That kind of sounds like a horror yeah. movie rather than... Yeah, I didn't um, really hang out with him. I just knew him. You just knew him. <laughs> but it's funny. This guy, he had a rowboat in the bay. Yep. And, and he fished. That's how he made his living. He would go out and get quahogs or clams. Yeah. And he would row all around town. I yeah. Mean, he didn't yeah. have a motor. He would row down to Mayan Beach. Or I don't think he ever went to Katamit, but he'd row to Mayan Beach and all over the, the Gray Gables and Buttermook Bay and row back. Wow. This guy lived to be over 100. Wow, wow. You know? Yeah. He was, you know, pretty, he lived a pretty happy life. Yeah, and he was somebody that was, was he known in town? I mean, did the... Oh, yeah, he, he had been married and, and yep. had children and apparently whatever happened in his life changed and he moved into a top paper shack. So he chose sort of the life of Walden to yeah. live, uh, live simply. Yeah, so he didn't write about it. Yeah, yeah, you know? right, it's right. Cool. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he's just... But, <laughs> if he wrote the book, it would be, uh, be a different story. <laughs> but I, I was always fascinated with him because I, I was always, just even as a little kid, I was into boats. Yeah, and yeah. In the, the coastal habitat and stuff. And, you know, I would go to the bay every day after school. Would you, you know? be able to wa just walk to Buttermilk Bay from home? Yeah, it, it was a different world. Was, the house had no locks. And yeah. I was from a big family. And as long as you were home at feeding time, you know, you were free to do whatever you wanted. We could walk downtown or we could go out of the bay or we could go whatever we wanted yeah we were supposed to go to school as long as you made it to school we were supposed to go to school <laughs> i wasn't really good at that hopefully the truant officer is not still looking for you skip <laughs> god you know i did I, I had issues with school yeah I, I, yeah i liked being outside yep yep still do mm -hmm. still do mm -hmm. i hear um a lot when i've been talking to people about um the past and born um it seems like a common theme is that the, the scallops used to be so much more plentiful, and the, the the fishing was 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 different. I mean, what was your experience with that? Can you did did you notice oh, a I difference had, I, between today and? Well, it, it all changed in the in the mid seventies. Yeah. A and at that time, that's when the grass beds really got wiped out. Without okay. grass beds, the scallop crops diminished because scallops grow really fast compared to other shellfish their lifespan is a year and a half i don't want to really oh. get too much into shellfish but yeah and, and, and eelgrass grew about this tall yeah you know about three feet tall and eelgrass when when scallops spawn they would cling to the eelgrass the spat yeah so yeah. they would be one stalk of grass might have 11 or 12 scallops on it oh one wow. stalk of grass yeah yeah you know wow and they, they'd live the first you know they, they had like a bisel thread they attached the grass and they'd hang on to that grass for the first probably six months of their life before they'd fall off and go to the bottom. Yep. Then they'd, you know, grow out for the next year. But without the grass. There was no, no, no nursery for the scallops. A lot of the nursery is gone. They, they yeah. still cling to rocks and things, but the main nursery is gone. Yeah. For scallops. Those scallops, and there were millions and millions and millions of scallops. Yeah. They, yeah. they would all eat. So... 
they would eat the nutrients. Okay. So once the grass is gone and the scallops are gone, you automatically get more nutrients. Right, which is an algae bloom. Yeah, or, yeah. I mean, there's a huge yeah. algae bloom going on right now. People don't know it. I right. mean, there's, yeah. there's a winter bloom in Katahmit that the, the algae is like cotton candy in the water. It's probably two inches off the bottom. Yeah. When that algae dies and decays, it uses up all the oxygen in the water at that, that level. Yep, yep. So if there's juvenile cohogs or juvenile scallops, or what, oysters not so much because the way oysters are shaped, mm -hmm. they actually get above the bottom okay. when they feed. Okay, yeah, but yeah. Clams and scallops and basic clams, clams and cohogs really. When, it, when they don't live too long without oxygen, they're kind of like us. Right. They need dissolved <laughs> oxygen. Right. So that first time when you have a bloom and it dies, if there's juvenile shellfish there, especially juvenile shellfish, because juvenile shellfish are like juvenile people that really, really move a lot. If uh -huh. you look at them under an electron, electron microscope, yeah. they really, really, really move a lot. They're very active. Yeah, yeah. Well, if you kill them, they're not there to eat the nutrients anymore either. Right, right. And we have wiped out whole year classes wow. many times. And do we know why, what happened with the eelgrass? I know, you know, it's not... Well, I, you know, this, this discussion is going from I know, where I, I wanted it to go to it, you know, an environmental discussion. <laughs> yeah, but, yeah. but what happened was in the late 60s, early 70s, the government really got into promoting sewer plants. To yep. the, the perception at the time was, you know, we're going to make the coast better by everybody tying into these sewer lines and the sewer all be processed in one place. Yeah. And then the remnants would be dumped into the coastal habitat. But they don't remove nutrients. Okay, okay. So, so too, like, they, too much they, nitrogen <coughs> going into the... Yeah, at one time. Yeah. I'll, and, and then if it rains or you have a bad storm, they just dump the sewer plants. I don't know if you're aware of that. Yeah, yeah. They do that. Yeah, and then yeah. all the pumping stations, if they break down, they're all set up to dump. Wow. So... Now, instead of filtering through the, the ground and coming in a little bit at a time at, at, on a regular rate. Yep, it just washes in. It comes in all at once. You get a huge bloom, and then, you know, it kills everything. Right, right. And you get these excessive algae blooms. The first thing they did was they'd be in the water, they'd coat the st strands of grass. The algae would. The algae and would. And so the scallops or the juvenile well, shellfish Well, the juvenile can't. shellfish couldn't stick to them. Yeah. But the grass itself would be dying. It's just oh, like your right. grass in the yard. Yeah. If you kept coating it, right. it would keep getting longer to get the sunlight that it needs. Yeah, yeah. And it wouldn't develop a good root system. Yep. And then the first winter comes. Right. And when the ice goes down and the grass freezes the ice, when the tide comes, it lifts up, it pulls it right out. So oh, it's wow. out. Roots and all comes right out. It doesn't break off. It's gone. Yeah. And then as long as this algae blooms. Wow. And the amazing thing is, like, we've seen such a change just in, in one person's lifetime. I mean, and that's, that's been such a common theme oh, yeah. is, you know, the, the difference in the ecology um, as, as, as I've been talking to people um, with, you know, the, the fact that the, the wildlife used to be so much more abundant, in particular the shellfish yeah. used to be more abundant. Yeah, so but, but I don't want to get too far off track with that topic. That's okay. Um, I, I, no, that became a passion in my life. Yeah. I'll be yeah. honest with you. Okay. I, I was a fisherman at the time. I saw the change. I bought my first commercial license in 1962. So yeah. by the mid-70s, I had been fishing for a while. Yeah. I saw this change. We, we went to town hall. We were really upset. There was yep. a lot of fishermen in town at the time. The selectmen at the time, I think it was Bob Perry and Barry Johnson and Bob Kilduff, they, they could see there was a huge economic impact on the town. Yeah. Uh, but Barry Johnson was on the County Shellfish Advisory Committee at the time. He came back with a couple of ideas for us to try to try and just survive. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. one of them was subtitled clamming, which is, you know, everybody knows that clams grow on the beach, but most people think they don't grow out in the ocean. So we all thought he was nuts. Yeah. Honest <laughs> to God, he came back and said this. And, but we tried it. And yeah. it actually turned out to be very successful. Okay, yeah. And a lot of these families kept in the fishery doing that rather yeah. than scalloping. But we couldn't do anything to bring the, scal the grass beds back. They would die in like crazy. Yeah, yeah. And once, and we were involved in this. We got involved with Woods Hole to study, you know, figure it out. By the time they actually began to study, about 80% of the grass beds were gone. Oh, wow. And now they try to say where the grass beds were. Yeah, 
Yeah. And they don't even know. And we know they were everywhere. I mean, they don't call, you know, where you live up around Eel, eel Pond. Eel Pond, I know, yeah. Because, you know, Eel Pond had a lot of eelgrass. Yeah. And a lot of eels. Yeah. It's coming back. I mean, it is slowly reestablishing yeah. itself, but it feels like just inches very a slowly, year. Very slowly. Yeah. Very slowly. Yeah. And then when you yeah. look at the big picture, what you see coming back is about a half a percent. Yep. Yep. That's really not a lot. It's yep. not. And then other places, I still see it diminishing. What can people do today to, to you know, not contribute to the further demise or to, 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 to help, help the, uh, the shell fisheries come back? Help the shell fisheries come back? Yeah. The scallop fishery, you really need the grass. Mm -hmm. The quahog and the clam fishery and the oyster fishery. When we bring in the county dredge, which is a big hydraulic dredge, yeah. that, that actually turns, but we get big sets of shellfish right behind that every time. When we had hydraulic clam in town, which is still legal, but nobody does it, that, that brought back the fishery. You know, we documented that over a 15 year period. We yeah. did a study, documented significant increase from just huge. But it was a, a social issue because it was nosy, right. noisy, right. and it was a social problem. It really wasn't anything else. It was, yeah. Yeah. And, and of course, it's always about, you know, not in my backyard thing. Yeah. Well, the, and there's the tension even with the mm -hmm. the eelgrass. You know, there's people people want a sandy beach in front of their their house instead of uh, instead of something that looks like a marsh or the sharp grass. Yeah. So there is that tension between the way we want to use the ocean for recreation or just to look beautiful and, and uh, yeah. you know, keeping it you healthy. Know, yeah, it's funny. Back in the 70s, and I was on the town recovery team, the dive team to yeah. recover bodies. In most of the town, you couldn't run an upward at low tide. The grass was so thick. Mm -hmm. It was really, really difficult. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and I, I want to get on something I heard parody say, and I want to explain something to you. But at that time, because you couldn't move around, the town had a big duck. It's parked down at the center now. Oh, okay. Yeah, like but a big military. A town, yeah, that yeah. was a town rescue vehicle. Okay. And that vehicle, because it had tires and a propeller, yeah. could go just about anywhere in this town at low tide. Oh, wow. You know, wow. and they'd go out on the Massey Flats. They'd go anywhere because when the propeller would get fouled, they put the, the tires in gear. Yep. And it, that thing would keep going. Yeah, yeah. You know, and we used to use it as, as an underwater recovery vehicle. And it was, you know, came from World War II, but... Uh, it was effective, wow. but of course, once the grass beds are gone, now they can you go anywhere on outboards. They yeah. don't need it anymore, and it sits there. Yeah, yeah. It's part of the military museum. Right, right, right. But uh, captain's yeah. interested in what we're saying here. He uh, he's an ocean dog, loves the beach himself. <laughs> and, and one of the, another big problem in the coastal habitat, because I'm not supposed to be going there. We're supposed to be doing another show. But <laughs> <laughs> and, and Bob Parody mentioned it. Yeah. You know, he would wake up in the morning in Miami Beach, and, and it would sound like a, a bunch of chainsaws out on the water that was yeah. really loud in the morning. And that's because outboard motors back in the 50s and 60s exhausted into the air. They didn't have a through hub exhaust. Yeah. And the exhaust went into the air rather than water. Okay. Well, and that was good because, you know, they were loud, but they weren't polluting the water. But right. now the exhaust from an outboard motor, it goes, it goes through the propeller and it's, it's homogenized into the water column. Yeah. In other words, and I, and I was watching this Saturday because it's something that really bothers me. <laughs> when the exhaust comes out of the, the outboard and hits the cold water, yeah. when I'm scallop and on Saturday, you know, no smoke, very few bubbles come up mm -hmm. behind me in the wake. Right. They, they get churned it's right into the somewhere. water column. It's going somewhere, yeah, yeah. And that, when it cools, it, it ends up in the water column. And it, it, another reason that we have low dissolved oxygen is, is the outboard motors and the proliferation of them all over the country. And people say, oh, yeah, well, they're fuel injected now. So they seem and cleaner. They mix oil. They, yeah. uh, they seem cleaner. Yeah. But if you put it in a freshwater tank mm -hmm. and put some fish in there or a saltwater tank mm -hmm. and you start that motor up and you put it in gear and you homogenize the exhaust into the water, yeah. it doesn't take long to kill all the fish. Right, right, right. And we actually did a video on this, and if you start an outboard motor up out of the water, yeah, you can't imagine how much smoke and exhaust actually comes out of it. Right, that you never see right. when it's driven into the water column. It just wow, it's a big, huge problem. Yeah, and prior to the introduction of that through hub exhaust, and, and that was in the 70s also, mm -hmm. we had huge 
you know, the environment was so different. Right, right, right. And, and they'll have to address that someday. Someday they're going to have to e exhaust outboards back into the air yeah. and put converters, catalytic converters or whatever on them. But well, and it seems like the, you know, the key is to have, you know, now that we have the awareness, you know, we, we sort of, a lot of these changes and, you know, the changes in the way that the, the storm water was, mm -hmm. was flowing into the ocean, I mean, those decisions were made before we were aware what, what the changes would produce. So now that we're aware, we at least have the tools to make better decisions in the future. But we don't and have the money to fix it. Yeah, yeah. Now, particularly now they're talking about the, did just the Wingham plant. I visited the Wingham, you know, I really care about the coastal habitat, and I mm -hmm. go check these places out, and I've been to the sewer plant in Wingham, and, and they do nutrient removal, but they don't remove medical waste. Oh. And that one's hooked into Toby Hospital, a lot yep. of nursing homes, and the medical waste also has a huge impact on the coastal habitat. Mm -hmm. And the more you tie into that and dump it in the coastal habitat, the worse it is. Yep. Yep. You only have to kill something once and it's not there to consume the nutrients anymore. Right, But right. The, it's a whole... And it throws the whole system out of balance. Yeah, yeah. and, and yeah. you take one biologist out of Woods Hole and they pick one thing and study that. And, I, and that yeah, they, I, I'm interested in, in how you got so involved with, uh, with, with all of this information and these details. How? Yeah, yeah. Well, I was a fisherman. I mean, you say you, d you, you didn't like school, but you seem so knowledgeable, and it seems like you've really studied this. I've, I've been really had the benefit of working with a lot of different sci scientists from the state yeah. and from Woods Hole um, because I was involved, and I cared about it, and I wanted to find the answers because I didn't want to see the coastal habitat die. I love it. I yep. do. I, I spent as much as 40 hours a week underwater diving, just making a living, but... It's just such a cool place. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah. It, it sounds stupid, but it is. Yep. You know, it's quiet, it's peaceful, and, and I liked it, and you know, nobody bothers you. Right, right, right. <laughs> but, but it was good, and I raised my kids in it. And, yeah, yeah. You know, and my father, and for generations, my family's been involved with, right. the, yeah, with the, the ocean, the seas. Yep, and, and, and in the town of Bourne. I mean, the name Barlow. Pretty much, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah we but, have... Uh, it's uh, it's all over the town, and, yeah. and um, how far back does do you, does your family go? Quite a ways. We're not, we're not Native Americans, but we go mm -hmm. back to the sixteen mid sixteen hundreds, early sixteen hundreds. Yep. Yeah. Um, it was kind of notorious. We're not <laughs> the reason that family and, and my family is remembered so well is not because we were good people. We we were just controversial people. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And. and I've never been afraid of controversy, and I've never been afraid to say what I feel, and it's gotten me in trouble a couple of times, uh -huh, at uh -huh. least. What <coughs> con controversy in the 1600s is probably different than controversy today, or were they a, yeah, a lot well, of the same Well, you struggles? know, it's funny. It's not funny, really. There was this guy, George Barlow, who had been a lawyer, and he'd been a preacher, and he was a really good drinker. <laughs> good drinker That's what yeah. he was. He, he yeah. was a drinker, so <laughs> he was preaching... He came to this area, and then he went up to Exeter, Maine, and, and Wells. He was up here. That was part of M Massachusetts Bay Colony mm -hmm. at the time. And uh, he was a preacher, but he was a drinker. Yeah. And he was banned from preaching because he was drinking. So, yep. Somebody <laughs> took him to court because he said something they didn't like. So then he was sent back down here because he had a law background also. He, he went back to Plymouth, and he became the marshal. And sandwich. Oh, wow. Okay. And, and his duty at the time was to uh, drive the Quakers yep. out of Sandwich. And he was a wicked wow. drinker. First, he had to figure out who they were. Yeah. yeah. So he hung out at Newcomb's Tavern down there and did a lot of drinking and yeah. a lot of talking and trying to figure out who the Quakers were. And when he knew, he was just really evil. Wow. He was evil. He did things like he, he went and took their cattle. Yeah. To try and make them leave, and they wouldn't leave, and he, uh, he, he just was horrible to them. I mean, and was it just a, a religious intolerance? The, you know, the, the what, what, what was, what was wrong with the Quakers? Well, the Quakers weren't, you know, the Pilgrims came here for religious reasons, mm -hmm. and they wanted to be whatever they wanted to be, and the Quakers weren't acceptable to the, the colony in Plymouth. So, yeah. And the colony of Plymouth, of course, was grown in the sixteen, early sixteen hundreds, and. They they didn't want the Quakers. They they ended the Quakers ended up most of them going to Rhode Island, but yeah. the ones in Sandwich they weren't going nowhere. And 
George kind of deteriorated to the point that he started cutting off their ears so everybody knew who they yeah, that oh was really gosh. bad. Wow. I mean, th wow. That was how much wow. it deteriorated. Yeah. I have to say, I, I was joking that, that the, um, the problems would have been different in the 1600s than they are today, but actually, it, 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 it was sounds very problems. familiar. Yeah, it's you know? social problems. Yeah. It's social either. problems, new groups coming in, right. and the old, you know, the people who, you know, with the old group not resisting anybody yep. who's not like us. Um, yeah. Wow. So it's, it's yeah. like so there's it's, nothing new under the sun in terms of. Uh, there really isn't. Yeah. It really yeah. takes a a change of, of heart to realize that we're you know we're we're all just mortals. Right. I mean right. we are and we all have a spirit and, you know, I'm not going there, but I'm going there. We all have this spirit within us that make you know, we take it for granted that we everything that happens, that we move our hands, that we feel we feel hot, we feel cold, we mm -hmm. I mean, you know. If you take the time to perceive everything that's going on and realize that th there's something in you that makes this happen, there's something within you besides your body that's there. I mean, yeah. there really is. There's, there's this spirit within you that, and, and, I, and I, I'm one of the very few people that have had an opportunity to have an experience that made me realize that the spirit doesn't die when your body dies. It's yeah. stupid, and I don't want to get into this. <laughs> Are you sure? I am, I am, okay. but I'm just telling you. So yeah. that, that's a perception, and once you realize your mortality, and mm -hmm. once you realize that you're, you know, you're really that, not that significant in this right. world. Right. You know, you're really not, yeah. and I'm not being smart, but you can make everything around you peaceful and comfortable and nice and really enjoy your surroundings and thank be thankful for everything. I mean, you know, you know, sometimes you're cold and you think, wow, I'm really cold and you feel bad. But if you're really cold sometimes and you're out there at night and you look up at the stars and you look at the sky, and you might be cold, but you know, it's pretty, pretty beautiful. Yeah, yeah. You know, I mean, Diane yeah. and I were doing it last night. We were down at Scusset Beach, you know, it was cold. It was beautiful. Yeah, It really yeah. was, you know, those kinds of things, people don't, I, I don't think people get it. I get it because I live in it. And yep. I lived And well we live in a pretty special place where yeah. um, there's opportunities just to to wonder and marvel at, at the beauty of but nature. But I'm sure that even you, world. you know, like you went to the mountains this weekend. Yep. <laughs> if you if you forget everything that's around you and just think about what's there and yeah. you know, it's really kind of like heaven. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And it really is and we're having this opportunity to enjoy this whole big picture of this world that's around us. Mm -hmm. And a lot of us get so involved in the minutia of day-to-day -day crap, so to speak, yep. that we don't realize what the big picture is and how much, it's not about money and it's not about, it, it's just about, wow, yeah. this place is pretty cool. Yeah. We're pretty lucky to be here, even for the little minute bit of time that we'll be here. Yeah, yeah. You know, and even time, that's something we created. Right, right, right. Wow, wow, Weird. you really give me something to think about. <laughs> I'm sorry. That's amazing. I, I'm not trying to, but you know, <laughs> it's, you know, and everybody has their passion. And yeah. My passion happened to be the coastal habitat. So yep. in order to try and find the answers that I needed, I would go to play. I wasn't afraid to go to Woods Hole and ask questions. I wasn't afraid if they said, yeah, well, if you think that, why would you support a study? Yeah, you know, let's go. Yep. You yep. know, and you know, no funding or anything. Let's just do it. Yep. Yep. You know, and and that was how I got to know a lot of different people in the state and in the in the federal government, and and I listened to a lot of thoughts that you know it yeah. goes all over the place. There's a lot of thoughts about sewage. There's a lot of thoughts about the coastal habitat. Some people think that people believe that what they're doing is making things better. I'll give you a perfect example. Yeah, let me hear about that. In the in the late seventies. The federal government found out that they were polluting a pond down in Falmouth mm -hmm. because they were using all the sewage on the basin, putting it through the plant, and it was up along to a pond. It was killing the pond. Yeah. So, oh, this is horrible. So they piped the sewage nine and a half miles, mm -hmm. so it leaches in to the canal over here by the skating rink. Oh wow. That at that time that was a good solution. Right, because it seemed like the ocean is yeah. is so enormous. It would, yeah. But it didn't take long, and they realized it wasn't a good idea. But you know, they still stand behind that idea, and they still do it because there's no, nothing else to do with it. Yeah. You yeah, know, and, and yeah. they don't do nutrient removal either, and that's yeah. the federal government who's demanding that 
everybody does it, but they don't do it. Yeah, yeah. You know, so you, you see these things and you go, what the hell? Right, right, right. <laughs> you know, so you just try to do what you can do. You have do. your own, yeah, you have just the, the little bit yeah. that you can do for the short time that you're yeah. here. And, yeah. And, you know, I've been on the Board of Health like for 20 years, and we, and we do have a lot of people put in nutrient removal systems all over town because yeah. you're trying to make it better. But there's so many, you know, like the problem with the upward, that's unbelievable. Yeah. And it's unbelievable that you really, it, it's hard to get through to people about that. How do you, what, what, what prevents you from just throwing your hands up and giving up? I mean, you know, it, it's, it can feel overwhelming. I'm a pain in the ass. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's not, it, it, you know, the, the, you know, I just don't give up. And, yeah. and of course, Diane, who's my other half, she doesn't give up either. And we, right. we, when we get involved in something, and we're very involved in different things, even the historic society right now, we, we follow through. Yeah. We get frustrated. Yep. No different than anybody else. But we hang in there. Yep. And I've tried, you can't imagine how many different angles I've come at problems right. to try and find a solution. And then I don't always find a solution, but I'm not afraid to change my course and try, try another tack. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, that, that's pretty much what I do. Yeah. Well, and I didn't mention at the beginning of the show that you are the current president of the Bourne Historical Society. Yeah, I am. And, uh, and so, you know, assisting and maintaining, protecting, preserving, and presenting the, uh, the history of Bourne through that channel as well. So, um, so you're, you're, you're quite a part of our history and a part of our, our, the present yeah. moment of the town. I, I'm <laughs> fortunate to have, I've got a really good board, and I've always been lucky to have a real group good group of people who yeah. support different things that I do and I do right now and it's just that's why, that's why things work is if you get in with a good group of people who are all willing to help you can get things done yeah you know? what's happening what's happening next with the town or with the historic society well the historic society we're putting up a pavilion there so we can have weddings and oh wow maybe class reunions family reunions yep and, you know small not middle size events, not big events, but middle size. There's good park in the air, there's yep. uh, trade on the canal, what's better than that? Right, at the Uptuxet at, at trading, trading post, post. Yeah. yeah, yeah. You know, and of course we have restrooms. So it's it, now, it's going to be a nice facility on when, the side of the bridge. Would that be available this summer? I mean, is that something well, that, that, um, that people could start I, I, looking for? We're really working to get it done for this summer. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's been a pretty mild winter so we've got a lot of work done and I think we're going to make it. Our building and grounds superintendent Ted Ellis, he's pretty confident that we're going to make it and uh, because he's so optimistic we're yeah. working really hard at it. And, well that's yeah. a pretty special spot um, at Tuxet it and it's nice that it's you know you're 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 working to make it even more accessible to uh, to more people in town. Yeah we've, so. we've done a lot there in the last few years. And yeah yeah. You know that the potential is unlimited you know, I mean, it's nice to have music in the park on the Bourne Buses Bay side of yep. the bridge, but it's hard to get there. The library has right. had music, but they, they're not on the canal. We've got the, we've got everything, right. and, and of course, the, the funding, their funding issues. Are and you can't take a train over the bridge for a dime like you used to be able to in the '50s anymore. So, no. <laughs> or, or just run across it and not pay nothing. Right. <laughs> you know, yeah, it was uh. just. <laughs> Well, Skip, yeah. I want to. I just want to thank you so much for joining me today and for joining us um, as we took this little glimpse through the, the the window to the past of Bourne. And thanks for sharing your specific perspective on uh, on yeah, uh, the. Yeah, uh, I, I I enjoy it, and thank you for having me. Thank you, and I, I hope I didn't bore you to death. No, you're fantastic. I, <laughs> no, I really. Uh, I think we're going to have you back. Actually, I think we just scratched yeah, the surface. Anytime. Yeah. Thank you so That's much. Good. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Thank Wonderful. you so much for joining us. Um, we'll see you next time. Thank you.